We're continuing with cardiovascular physiology. We're going to start first with an overview of the cardiovascular system and a recap from anatomy. Then we're going to take a look at the relationship of pressure, volume, flow, and resistance. And of course, we're taking a closer look at how the heart as a muscle, as a pump, how it works. Now let's first take a look at what the cardiovascular system is doing for you. Of course, it's mostly about moving stuff. So what's listed here first is um, oxygen. Of course, we need to move oxygen from the lungs to all the body cells. Then we need to move nutrients and water around. Uh, we need to pick up the trash, the waste, and get rid of that. Um, we need to also transport um, antibodies, clotting proteins, hormones, stored nutrients, and then materials that will leave the body would be all the waste products, also heat, and then some carbon dioxide, the gas. Okay, so uh, the cardiovascular system here is composed of the heart, which is the big pump that um, drives the movement of the blood and everything that's in the blood. Then we have blood vessels that are attached that are um, going from relatively large vessels to tiny ones. And so we have um, veins and venules, arteries, arterioles, and then capillaries by size, sorted. And um, we have a pulmonary and a systemic circuit. So the pulmonary circuit would be between the heart and the lungs and the systemic circulations between the heart and the body. And in the blood, as you know already, we have cells, mostly red blood cells, some white blood cells, and then the plasma, the liquid portion of the blood. So here is your anatomy overview and review for the cardiovascular system. Take a look at here. The This will be the pulmonary circuit right here between the heart and the lungs and then everything else um, that will be the systemic circuit where we're leaving the left ventricle and we're going through all the different body parts and then returning back here to the right side of the heart. Um, the um, blood flow is going down a uh, pressure gradient. So we're starting out with the highest average pressure. So this here is the mean arterial pressure. And uh, in the aorta, just leaving the left ventricle, um, you have the highest average pressure. And it's listed here at 93 millimeters of the mercury. And the reason for that is that number comes about when you are um, using a formula that calculates the average or, um, average pressure in the aorta. And uh, let me give you that, that formula. It's um, basically when you're measuring somebody's blood pressure, the average or textbook values we'll say 120 over 80 and um, 120 being the systolic pressure and 80 being the diastolic pressure and then the way you would intuitively I'm sure you would you would want to calculate well 120 plus 80 is 200 divided by 2 is 100 so how come we're not exactly in between when we are saying average or mean arterial pressure well the reason is we spend only about one third of the time of a cardiac cycle time on the systolic side and two third on the diastolic side so we need to account for that so the way this is calculated in the end is we're going to calculate the mean arterial pressure, the MAP, by taking 120, that's the systolic number, plus 2 times 80, the diastolic side, we're going to double that, um, and then we're going to divide by 3, and that's how you're going to get the 93 millimeters of the mercury that they're talking about right here. Okay, so in the aorta, that's where you have the highest average pressure. Then you're going into arteries, arterioles, capillaries, and even though these these blood vessels are getting smaller, but you're having so many more of them. The cross-sectional diameter, the collective diameter of these gets larger and larger. And as we're coming out of a capillary bed, our pressure literally approaches zero. On the venous side, in order to move the blood back up, you're going to have to use some tricks because you don't have another pump. And we're going to talk about that later. So the pressure changes, they created by contracting muscles, of course, um, the driving pressure is created by the ventricles. That would be um, the, main, the main pressure out of the left ventricle. 
And if blood vessels dilate, if the blood vessel diameter is bigger or gets bigger, then the blood pressure will decrease. If the blood vessels constrict or there is some sort of a blockage, then the blood pressure increases. Volume changes, of course, also affect the blood pressure in the cardiovascular system. That's why people with already high blood pressure are always instructed to not have so much salt in their diet because salt retains water and water is volume and volume will up the blood pressure even more. Okay. Now let's take a look at how a fluid, such as blood, moves through a system of tubes like we have in the cardiovascular system. And we'll quickly find out that um, the, the amount of flow depends on the pressure gradient and the resistance to the flow. So um, we have a little formula here, and that means that the flow is proportional to the pressure gradient. Um, the higher the pressure gradient, the greater the fluid flow. And the resistance uh, presents the opposition to flow. So depending on the blood vessel diameter, uh, you're going to have resistance or opposition to flow. So a small change in radius usually has a large effect on the resistance to blood flow. In other words, if you have a bunch of um, clogged up blood vessels, that will easily increase your pressure in the system because you are narrowing the available space for um, the, the flow or you're creating more opposition to flow. So vasoconstriction in a, uh, is a decrease in blood vessel diameter and it will decrease blood flow. So smaller diameter vasoconstriction decreases blood flow. And by contrast, vasodilation, now you have an increase in blood, blood vessel diameter that will increase the blood flow. And here's your formula. The flow is proportional to the pressure gradient divided by the resistance. In other words, the flow of blood throughout the cardiovascular system is directly proportional to the pressure gradient and inversely proportional to the resistance and flow. It sounds very technical right now. We're going to um, work with this and you will, see, you will get more familiar with this concept. So here is how you calculate the mean arterial pressure. Uh, that's what I gave you earlier the average pressure in the system. Um, there are two ways you, to, to calculate it. The formula that I gave you earlier was this one right here, that you are taking the systolic pressure, the SP, plus two times the diastolic pressure, um, that, that's the DP, and then divide by three. So if we are assuming a normal blood pressure of 120 over 80, which is sort of this textbook blood pressure, then you have 120 plus 2 times 80. So that would be 120 plus 160, and that's 280. One third of that, or divided by 3, that comes out to 93.3. So we're going to round that to the nearest full millimeter of the mercury. So that's where the 93 millimeters of the mercury came from that we had earlier on the mean arterial pressure. You can also use this formula right here. Uh, for that, you would have to know the pulse pressure. PP is the pulse pressure. Now, the pulse pressure is simple. Uh, that is the systolic pressure minus the diastolic pressure. Now, with the numbers given right here, the pulse pressure comes out to 120 minus 80, and that's equal to 40 millimeters of the mercury course. Now, you can take one third of the pulse pressure, so 40 divided by 3, that will be 13. Let's just write it out. 13.3, right? 40 divided by 3 is 13.3, plus the diastolic pressure uh, is 80. So it's 80, and that comes out, guess what, to 93.3 millimeters of the mercury. Okay, you can see that both of these formulas lead to the same uh, result. Um, it's up to you which one you want to use, but you need to know these formulas for both lecture and for lab. Um, the, so might as well just memorize one or the other. Uh, you do have to know these. Okay. So now moving on here, this is a little bit of an anatomy review. The heart is in your chest cavity. It is um, sort of resting the apex of the heart. So down here, the apex of the heart is resting on the diaphragm right here. And, you know, depending on how much space you have, the lungs and other tissues that need to be there, major blood vessels. So uh, the typical mean electric axis, so meaning the interventricular septum and the mean 
the most of the the thrust of the electric activity going down the interventricular septum usually points in this direction. So or kind of slightly tilted to the left, kind of more pushed over to the left. And so that's the anatomical position. Here the anatomy of the thoracic cavity. You can take a look at that and review that. And here's your heart by itself. Uh, again, you can always see that it's uh, in the anatomical position, sort of pointed to the left with the apex of the heart kind of pointing in sort of the 60 degree angle. If you consider a circle starting here at zero, and uh, this will be 90 degrees, then uh, the, the mean electric axis is kind of, and the interventricular septum is kind of pointing in the 60 degree range approximately. So here, another anatomy table here, uh, the heart, major blood vessels. Of course, in the heart, we have the four chambers. We have the right and left atrium, right and left ventricle, and um, where they send in the blood to, you can review that. The major blood vessels, the vena cava, the superior and inferior vena cava, and then we have the pulmonary trunk that's leaving the right ventricle. We have the pulmonary vein that's bringing blood back from the lungs to the left side of the heart. And then we have the aorta that's leaving the blood vessel where the blood is leaving the left ventricle. So review that as needed here. We know the section of the heart where you can see the valves. Make sure that you know we have four valves that we're dealing with. There are the two AV valves. On the right side, we have the right AV valve, also known as tricuspid valve. And on the left side, we have the left AV valve or bicuspid valve, sometimes also called mitral valve. And then um, between the ventricles and the major blood vessels leaving the ventricle, we have two semilunar valves. So that will be on the right side. It will be the pulmonary semilunar valve. That's this one right here, getting us up to the lungs. And then on the left side of the heart, we're going to have the aortic semilunar valve that's kind of covered up, just sort of hidden behind here, that gets us toward the aorta. And of course, uh, the valves are there to prevent backflow. And then here, developmentally speaking, this is how your heart forms. And um, you can take a look at that. That's not super important for us. Okay, the heart valves, they ensure one-way flow through the heart, as we just mentioned. And you can reference the, um, the picture that I had, this diagram, the two AV valves and the two semilunar valves. Make sure that you understand it. So that's anatomy review, the two AV valves and the two semilunar valves. And the purpose of the valves is to prevent backflow. So here, the valves, one more time, you can take a look at that uh, from different sections and take a look at how they work. They are there to prevent backflow. Okay, so now let's take a look at the cardiac muscle. We have contractile cells there. Uh, they resemble very much the uh, skeletal muscle, um, except that they are not under voluntary control, but they are under, of course, the control of the autonomic nervous system. Hopefully you remember the cardiac muscle is one of the effectors of the autonomic nervous system. So the contractile cells of the heart are striated fibers organized into sarcomeres, just very similar to skeletal muscle. But then we also have autorhythmic cells or pacemaker cells, and they send every so often a signal for contraction. And so they will approach the threshold voltage on a rhythmic basis, on a regular basis, and then they send the next signal, which then travels throughout the entire myocardium and leads to the next contraction. Now these autorhythmic or pacemaker cells, they're smaller, fewer contractile fibers compared to contractile cells, and they don't have this organization to sarcomeres. So you can take a look at this uh, comparison here, cardiac muscle versus skeletal muscle, and uh, just kind of read through that. Um, cardiac muscle cells they are smaller, have a single nucleus per fiber. They branch and join neighboring cells through these intercalated discs. That's a very important because these intercalated discs, they have lots and lots of gap junction channels to provide this electrical connection between the cells. Um, we do have still T-tubules, but they're larger and they branch, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is smaller. And then mitochondria occupy one third of the cell volume. Um, let's quickly think why that might be. Well, the heart is the ultimate endurance muscle, and so you need to have lots and lots of mitochondria for oxidative metabolism to provide the energy, the ATP, for the heart to work 
continuously. Remember, 24-7, 365, no breaks, no vacation. You're expecting to, your heart to do a lot of work, so you need to supply the energy for that. Here's a diagram that shows how myocardial cells, they have these intercalated discs, uh, the connections, they have a single nucleus, and they do have the striations right here. And here's another diagram showing some cardiac muscle cells.